good afternoon. It is uh, with great pleasure that I open this webinar entitled Art Writing Futures, A View from the United States. ICA US organized Art Writing Futures for ICA International Webinar Program, which we created in response to the pandemic that unfortunately is still ravaging the world. I'm happy to say that it is our 10th event in the series with two more webinars to come as part of our 2021 project. Since the creation of ICA International in the late 1940s, our ongoing concern has been the global practice of art criticism a concern that is constantly updated as our world changes. Today's webinar addresses art criticism contemporary reality and explores what might be ahead in the future. I want to salute ICA US President Norma Kriblat and Vice President Judith Stein and thank them for their section's participation in ICA International's online program. I extend a warm welcome to all the US members who are present today and express my sincere appreciation to the speakers and to the moderator of today's presentation. I send warm greetings to all members of ICA International and to the public registered for this webinar. Thank you for coming. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted tomorrow on our YouTube channel for wider dissemination. Please send your questions and comments via chat and unmute your microphones. I now give the floor to the U.S. President, Norman Kliblet, for his opening remarks. Thank you very much for your attention and have an excellent debate. Thank you, Elizabeth, especially for reminding us that the state of art criticism is an old, yes, ancient um, one, but certainly one of the founding principles and political issues for ACA International at the end of the 40s and the beginning of the 50s. Thank you too for challenging the ACA USA, ACA USA chapter. I never pronounce ICA properly. I'm always told I will, I'm hopeless. Um, um, among others to ponder a webinar on such a subject. When we received your request, and discussed it with a group of our board members, we were initially baffled. What do we have to say? Is there anything new? At first, we couldn't see the forest for the trees. However, a group of our board members got together on Zoom, of course, to discuss whether we had anything to propose, and if so, what that might be. That group included our former managing director, Jamie Kiesling, board members Will Fenstermacher, Seth Rodney, um, Judith Stein, and myself. We realized all too quickly that we had indeed been dealing with serious issues and problems in criticism for quite some time. All this brought to a head by the pandemic and more importantly, by the blatant issues raised by the murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis um, policeman. In direct reaction to these crises, a group of our board members created an urgent response committee proposing possible actions we might take um, on all these various issues that came that keep coming forward and were brought to a, a head. These numerous deliberations about racism, diversity, and access, among other issues, became the inescapable basis for today's webinar. I'm pleased that Rog Vartanian, who's editor-in-chief and co-founder of Hyperallergic, accepted our invitation um, to, um, to moderate and thank him for and the panel's participation, participants for their insights. 
A perfect intermediary, Rog, is an art critic, curator, artist, and lecturer um, with expertise at the intersection of art and politics. Some of his notable essays these past few years include the foreword to the book, Artist as Cultural Producer. That essay was titled, Imagining the Future Before Us, and his critique of A Tribute to Light. To light, and that's only the list on the itty bitty card I'm holding. So, Rog, thank you and welcome. Great, thank you, Norman. Thank you for everyone for the invitation. I'm excited uh, to, to talk to all these wonderful panelists today. So, just to give you an idea of the program, just so you can anticipate what we're going to be doing, I'm just going to talk for a few minutes, raising some questions as a moderator and somebody who has, uh, you know, really. Uh, been thinking through some of these issues uh, through a sort of a daily work grind of running an art publication. Um, and then the, each of the uh, participants will be speaking for roughly eight or nine minutes each. And then we're going to be opening it up for questions, roughly about 15, 20 minutes, depending on how much time we have. And I'm just going to ask everyone to add their questions to the chat. I'll be, I'll be taking a look throughout the whole conversation. So uh, hopefully you can uh, keep your excitement to the end and then we'll just ask uh, ask those questions and hopefully the panelists will also have questions for each other i always welcome that and uh and we'll get going so you know 12 years ago this month actually we started hyperallergic and one of the reasons that we started it was the fact that there was a real um what seemed to be the death keel for like critics and, and writing about criticism in mainstream, quote unquote, mainstream publications. Uh, particularly newspapers were at that time, you know, losing and shedding critics, it felt like every year to the point where the, when the recession in 2008, the housing crisis hit, um, it felt like it was just the next wave of the shedding of more critics from, from many legacy and mainstream publications. And that was, of course, uh, very disturbing for many of us who really thought criticism had a really important role to play. But then this conversation also brought up some issues that, you know, I just like to ask questions. I don't expect every panelist to be answering these, but I think um, one of the benefits of an event like this is we can just think out loud in public and share our thoughts on different things. Um, so one of the things I've been thinking a lot about recently is, why there is a lot of hesitation, particularly for young critics to write any type of criticism that may be perceived by people as negative or any kind of negative criticism. And I think this has been a chronic issue that has been raised, um, you know, certainly not new, but I do think there is a particular um, newness to this topic because of the prevalence of social media and immediate responses to things like criticism, often by people that are not vested in a topic or per perhaps aren't as informed in the topic as the critics that might be writing or the audience that, they, that the piece of criticism is often intended for. Um, but also thinking a little bit about the emotional labor involved in writing criticism and what are the benefits if a critic decides to engage with, a, with an artwork with a very critical lens. It raises questions for me of, as to whether there are advantages to writing something that may not be just laudatory or positive about that. Um, and I think that manifests itself, particularly for an online publication, uh, which I run, it, it, bring, it brings up the fact that when something is often negative, it's often not shared. I think there's a mistaken perception that just if something is negative, everyone wants to read it, everyone's looking at it, everyone's sharing it. And that's simply not true. Um, unless that person is very famous or if that person, it's a highly controversial topic. Um, but the reality is much more nuanced in terms of what people read and share and engage with um, online. And then of course, the issue that when people are criticizing and there's this real fear, particularly around young critics that I talk to regularly of the notion, and one critic actually said this to me, they were afraid to write something negative because they didn't want to be ostracized from a community they felt so that they had worked so hard to become a part of. And that was a real thing that somebody had told me um, just actually a few weeks ago. But then it also raises the question is, um, how are we supporting those people that, that, and I mean, as a community, because, you know, that feeling of being ostracized or, you know, some may call it canceled, 
Um, you know, people, are, it's a real fear that particularly around, uh, among young writers seems to be percolating. And I have to say, it caught me off guard in the last couple of years where it feels like this is a real psychological sort of um, condition a lot of younger critics seem to are really afraid of the notion of being canceled. Now, how can criticism thrive in an environment where that feels like it's a real thing for a lot of people? Um, and I'm not one to believe that canceling actually works. I wish it did sometimes, but I actually don't think it, uh, it you know, it, it often uh, wields a much heavier uh, perceptual sword, maybe than an actual sword, but it is something that we have to think about when we're talking about this. So one of the things I, I was thinking about, and I challenged the panelists to think about a little bit, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about this later, or maybe some of them will address it in their remarks, is when, did, when does criticism work and when does it not work? Um, and one piece I wanted to bring up in terms of what I think worked, but then was sort of interesting, it sort of brought up other issues, was in 2014 on Hyperallergic, we had, high, we had published a piece by Ryan Wong, a critic, an Asian American critic, who was critical of Joe Scanlon's Donnell Wolford um, piece that was at the Whitney Biennial in 2014. So Ryan Wong decided to appropriate this piece by, um, by Joe Scanlon, who is a, a white uh, Ivy League uh, art professor at Princeton, and decided to appropriate that as a way to sort of complicate the question of the Donnell Wolford project, which essentially was uh, concocting this image of a black female artist that he hired an actress to play um, in institutions and the way it circulated. I thought it was a br brilliant use of satire um, a, in terms of as a tool for criticism. But then what I wasn't prepared for was afterwards how many people believed it. And there wasn't a critical lens in terms of understanding that it was a critique of the piece rather than actually someone claiming the piece. And satire, which is, of course, one of the biggest uh, tools we can wield as critics and writers, has been very difficult to manage on the internet where things are believed perpetually rather than questioned. And I don't have to, uh, I have many examples. It's one of the reasons we don't use uh, satire as often as we once did at Hyperallergic, because one year, for instance, I wrote about um, ISIS participating in the Venice Biennale where people would bring their objects to have ISIS destroy them on their barge. And believe it or not, up to four or five years after that article was published, people still would come up to me and say, I can't believe you got that exclusive story realizing that people were not looking critically at the material being published in different ways. And it's certainly not the only story. There are a number of these stories, um, but I just wanna raise these because I think these are all important questions we should be thinking about, but I'm sure the panelists will be directing our attention elsewhere. So um, hopefully this will be part of the Q&A afterwards. So I'm gonna start, um, I'm gonna be introducing each of the panelists uh, before they speak and we'll be going alphabetically. So the first speaker is Jasmine Amusen, who's the editor of Burn Away. Born in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, she has lived in the South for most of her working life. She is the 2020 McDowell Calderwood Fellow of Journalism. Jasmine, you have the screen. Hi, thank you for that. Um, thank you for AITA and everyone for inviting me from, um, I am calling in from Atlanta, Georgia, where the magazine Burnaway is based. Um, founded in 2008, uh, just sort of like hyperallergic, it was a reaction to the decimation of the arts and features uh, portion of the Atlanta Journal Constitution. So we've been publishing online basically every other day since then. Um, and I have worked for the magazine since 2019. Um, I, I am very, when I was first approached to uh, participate in this talk, I was sort of um, unsure why I was asked. We are a regional focused magazine. So our coverage area is from West Virginia to Texas, and that includes Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Haiti. Um, this is a region that is economically disadvantaged, uh, politically terrorized, um, and environmentally in extreme danger. Um, and the people who are working in the South have 
that always on their mind as they're making art and making work. But what I discovered when I moved to Atlanta in 2011 was that there was extreme pressure on young artists or young writers or young anybody um, to get out of the South as fast as possible. We were told like, there is no way for you to make it as a creative person in the Southern United States, unless you move to New York, LA, Chicago, London, literally anywhere else. Um, so in the second iteration of the magazine, when our sort of new administration took over, we decided to uh, be diametrically opposed to that idea in totality. We wanted to be part of an ecosystem that was thriving and sustainable and would tell young artists, young activists, that there is a path forward for you in this place that you love and you do not have to leave. So um, since 2014, we have been running a arts education uh, program for critics, mainly critics of color, uh, because um, in Atlanta specifically, the first tragedy of what could have been a bountiful arts ecosystem was in the 1950s when um, a group of millionaire philanthropists took a plane to France on an art buying expedition and crashed and died outside of the Orly Airport. Um, and it set the city of Atlanta, the state of Georgia, in terms of sort of art world building back by 40 or 50 years. Um, I do, when you were making your opening remarks uh, about negative criticism and why do young critics sort of shy away from what negative criticism um, does or is or I, I kind of want to push back on that because I think that when I hear the word negative, I don't think of the word critical. I think you can be critical and you can be um, not negative. Uh, in my personal practice and the practice that I engage my writers with at Burnaway is um, one of not negativity. If you don't like a work, that's fine, that's great. Can you tell me why? Can you explain it? And I don't think that's negative. Um, I also am unsure if anything written about the South could be considered negative because the people who are reading it outside of the South certainly think negative about whatever we're doing. Um, the South has catastrophic PR. Um, we, people, really don't like us and don't take the art we're making here seriously or um, the work we're doing here seriously until it's an emergency and um, democracy is on the line. And then it's very, very urgent that people know what we're doing, what we're talking about. Um, and I don't mean to sound upset about that. I think it's long overdue that somebody um, pay attention to the work that people have been grinding and grinding out here for, for decades with no sort of um, national recognition or interaction. Um, it's it's sort of like a joke that you have to be uh, a 90 year old uh, black woman from the South to get shown in New York. Um, it's a very, uh, it's a place that is constantly looked down upon. So I don't feel that there's any reason to contribute to the negativity of how um, most of the nation and internationally views the region in which we work um, and the art that we're trying to support. Um, because what happens in the South, what happens in the Southern United States, including the Caribbean, um, is what will happen to everyone else. So what happens here in the South, whether that be fantastic or horrible or anywhere in between is the bellwether for what will happen next. Right now there's a um, Supreme Court case, who knows if we'll take it up about uh, the state of Mississippi versus the state of Tennessee about who controls a water table that exists from Memphis to Tupelo. Now that's an extremely 
important. Like we're talking about a, a water war and the South is engaged in water wars across the region. And that will be what happens next to everyone else. Um, the internal displacement from storms, hurricanes, things like that, that will only accelerate and be um, more prominent for everyone else. Um, so how do I make people who are living in these emergencies and who are living with this sort of like psychic disdain, how do I make them be interested in art and be interested in making it and be interested in writing critically about it? Um, and the way I've tried to make that leap of care is by highlighting work and artists who um, might not traditionally be seen as um, a great artist or a, a great somebody that people find important from here. Um, the dominant export from Atlanta is rap music. It's billions of dollars. It's a huge industry. It is 8% or something of Atlanta's GDP. Um, and that is not considered art. And how do I tell people that this is the most important art form that is coming out of the city right now? Uh, and by talking about that and by connecting that to um, photographers that are working with black cowboys or um, other sort of uh, regional artists, I can make the case that this is art and it is important and um, that you can talk about it. I, I really feel that making art criticism accessible will be the only way that um, our profession survives. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's, my, um, that's my little spiel about uh, working down here. Great, thanks Jasmine. Um, uh, you know, I'm excited. I didn't, I didn't realize that uh, Burn Away was partly res response to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution cutting uh, arts. It, that's, that's so interesting how it, it definitely sort of was a moment where a lot of the stuff was happening. And I'm excited during the Q&A to talk a little bit more about that sort of negative question, because I think, as I said in my comments, it's what's perceived as negative, because I think sometimes right. what's perceived as negative isn't necessarily even intended as negative, necessarily. Right. So it's, it's an interesting question. My favorite story along that line is once an artist was very, was, thought I was giving them a negative review because in a group show, I never mentioned their work in a group show. And so they saw it, perceived it as negative. So, but we could come up with all these sort of anecdotes and talk during the Q&A. So let's continue right. on. So, so wait, just, just one, um, one thing that I did, I did think about um, as criticism that didn't work is mm -hmm. um, it was, sort of talked about a lot here in Atlanta was the response to um, the Dana Schultz painting in the Whitney Biennial um, mm -hmm. and all the stuff that happened around it was confusing to people here because they it wasn't enraging it wasn't cathartic for them to be angry um, people just sort of didn't get the discourse around it but that's because uh, we're here and we live among those sort of tragedies and bodies every day. That's, that's, a, that's such a great point. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, so we're going to move on and uh, to John Wu, Jeremy Kim, who is an associate professor of art history and critical theory at Carnegie Mellon University School of Art. As a specialist of modernism and contemporary art, Kim explores the transdisciplinary intersections of art history, queer studies, and Asian American decolonial theory. Kim's publications include Painted Men in Britain, Queer Difficulty in Art and Poetry, and Filming the Queerness of Comfort Women. As a critic, a crit a Kim contributed articles to ASAP Journal, The Brooklyn Rail, and CAA Reviews. The screen is yours. Thank you. For the next eight minutes, I'm going to talk about the selfhood of an, of an art writer. Zhang Wu, how did you end up working on white people's art? That is one of the most urgent questions I've taken since I started teaching at Carnegie Mellon University three years ago. My most recent book manuscript under review for publication, please keep your fingers crossed, is an act of leave-taking. In that book, 
male body is unmade, I examine the unbelonging of white cisgender male artists configuring same-sex desire in the 20th century. Conclude, conclude, concluding that process of disidentification vis-a-vis -vis my white other, I am now seeking to channel my research activities into the contemporary struggle of making queer POC migrant art in the United States, art that is incommensurate with white supremacy and structural racism. I would like to share a few paragraphs I have written in the epilogue of Male Bodies Unmade. What about I? Every time I type I into my discussions of Beersley, Cocteau, Bacon, Hockney, and Gober, or whenever I choose to have I concealed, I feel a little icky and unsettled. Um, entering what CN Ungai calls a bestiary of affects. I, have I am trained to write as though I write in the name of knowledge for all to consider. When my readers truly heed my words, and if those words are good, I must trust that they will experience artworks in the way that I see and understand why they need to augment or alter their previous approaches. I was taught to believe this, but all my teachers in the fields of Western art were white scholars writing primarily for Western academia with their expansive resonance of I. Their capacity to pronounce I in English is greater than mine not only because English is my second language, but also because I am not white. Kathy Park Hong points out in Minor Feelings on Asian American Reckoning, quote, Roland Barthes said, literature is that neuter, that composite, that oblique into which every subject escapes, the trap where all identity is lost, beginning with the very identity of the body that writes. But when I became a published poet, I couldn't suspend my Asian female identity no matter what I wrote. Even in the absence of my body, my spectral authorial identity hampered the magnitude and range in which my voice reached readers. How naive to think that my invisibility meant I could play God. If Whitman's eye contained the multitudes my I contained 5.6% of this country, end of quote. Bart was a white cisgender lover of a man who wrote in French. Whitman was a white cisgender lover of a man who wrote in English. Had I been writing in Korean for Korean readers, my I might be able to materialize an escape, actualize a trap, and embrace multitudes. But I write in English, about white cisgender queer, queer artworks configuring white cisgender same-sex male desire. In what ways does my authorial identity of Asian American I interrupt analysis and persuasion? In my instability of utterance and its hamperings, I become a minoritarian writer to lose and what to repostulate, quote, if the writer is in the margins or completely outside, outside his or her fragile community, the situation allows the writer all the more the possibility to express another possible community and to forge the means for another consciousness and another sensibility. How many people today live in a language that is not their own or no longer or not yet, even know their own and know poorly the major language that they are forced to serve. How to become a nomad and an immigrant and a gypsy in relation to one's own language, end of quote. The limitations of my minoritarian shifter I, in fact, fuel my analytical strength 
and they always coincide with my deep gratitude toward Western academia. I would not have survived its Eastern counterparts without irrevocably damage, damaging myself in the process. Specifically, I cannot thank enough the many white cisgender gay men I encountered as my teachers, colleagues, and classmates in the United States, England, and Holland, who welcomed me to, into the fold and showed me the ropes. And I worked hard to be like them and be liked by them. Now that all these years have passed, passed, may I finally admit to myself, though, without sounding disrespectful, that I never felt poorly wholly part of them. I have been in the margins or completely outside my fragile community. What we formed was a commons of incommensurability. It was a beautiful, but I was an outsider insider. I never stopped feeling awkward, inadequate, and added on, always a little bit off, even when the going was good. In the end, it was all a series of pretending and failing, never succeeding. I used to think that I did something wrong, like my vowels, for instance, or my definite, indefinite articles, and needed to try harder. Now I know this self-blame is something I need to let go. As I conclude this book, searching for another possible community, another consciousness, and another sensibility, I see my unbelonging marks a leave-taking that I must do. I'm already at the non-place that must be thought outside to be sensed inside, or the undercommons. I have already become a nomad, an immigrant, and a gypsy in relation to my own language. Nah, it sounds as if I'm saying no with the attitude, ennui, superciliousness, fake nonchalance, insincerity, and exhaustion. But that is how a Korean would refer to himself, herself, themselves, when there is no need to express humility toward the listeners. The shifter in Korean that humbles the speaker in relation to the listener is ja, which sounds a bit like I in French. I love this. Essentially, in the least inhibited form of Korean, banmal, or half-speech, I can reveal the other truth as a queer, polyglot, immigrant citizen of the West. I am the site of self-affirmation as well as irreverent negation of that affirmation. I sound like myself or na when I'm writing about white troubles in our history, and I'm saying most clearly, na, yes, that's me, and no thanks, each time I address the visual imagination of a white homosexuality inhabiting cisgender male bodies. Thank you. Thank you, Jung Wu. Excellent. Um, so now we're going to continue on to Greg Tate, who is a writer, cultural provocateur, and musician who has lived in Harlem since 1984. He was a staff writer at the Village Voice from 1987 to 2004. His books include Flyboy in the Buttermilk, as well as Flyboy 2, The Greg Tate Reader, Everything But the Burden, What White People Are Taking from Black Culture and Midnight Lightning, Jimi Hendrix and the Black Experience, um, and forthcoming from Duke University Press in 2022 is a collection of his writings on visual culture entitled White Cube Fever, Writings and Conjurings on the Dark Arts. As a visiting professor, he has taught at San Francisco State University, Brown University, Yale School of Art, NYU, Williams College, and Princeton's College of the Humanities. Tay, Greg, the screen is yours. Greg, uh, we can't hear you. You have to unmute. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was thinking about um, my own history, education, training, in terms of uh, 
critical visuality, critical visuality around uh, black culture. And, um, and I realized that it began in the home with my mother, um, and who was uh, a radical activist in the 60s and 70s, um, worked with uh, people like Stokely Carmichael and H. Rap Brown and Miri Baraka, you know. And, um, but it was also like for most of her life, a serious collector of art as well. Um, and art that um, she brought into the home from travels in Africa in the Caribbean and then as well from um, uh, some artists who became uh, uh, my teachers at Howard University. Um, and Howard was critical because that was a place where I actually learned about visuality, critical visuality from artists, you know, um, and um, Holly Jarima in the film department, um, painters of the Afro Cobra school. Uh, who taught there, uh, Jeff Donaldson and uh, Wadsworth, Jarrell, um, and um, as well, there was an amazing uh, uh, Ethiopian painter there, Skunda Bogassian, you know. And so, um, sorry about that. Um, and then um, even in terms of uh, literature, um, my training came from, um, uh, you know, people like Ethelbert Miller was a poet, um, at, uh, at, uh, in Howard's, uh, resource center. And, um, so in fact, that period in which, uh, I was in DC was one in which, um, there was so much conversation going on around theory, around culture, around visuality and and poetics that i was assimilating uh tools i didn't need oh right um is everybody still there hello hello Hello, sounds hello. good. Sounds sounds good on our end. Okay, yeah, yeah. It seemed uh, seemed to have dropped out there for a second. Um, but um, you know, the thing is, I um, when I began to write uh, as a critic, it was as a as a music critic, and it was um, you know uh, professionally it began at the Village Voice which is an institution that definitely enabled the writer's voice and enabled um, writers to be as, uh, as uh, kind of free flowing and as uh, unabiding by traditional rules in terms of uh, how one approached whatever the, uh, the, uh, the subject was. So in your language there, you were definitely encouraged to to treat it as like a free space, a liberated zone. And um, to the extent that you were edited, um, you were edited around, you know, um, you know, some basic rules of, <laughs> of uh, grammar and punctuation, but even those could be challenged uh, because of the kind of editorial setup that you had. So, um, and that pretty much, you know, encompassed, um, you know, the way that I came to develop and know myself and to, and to project a voice um, through criticism, you know, uh, through journalism, you know, for the first uh, 10 years I was there, you know, at the, um, at the paper and, you know, surrounded by colleagues uh, who were also pretty much doing the same thing. Um, but there were some interesting incidents that occurred in the course of um, the voice claiming to be this space where um, um, the writer's voice was um, uh, empowered and, and supported and um, encouraged and their, their criticality was encouraged. Specifically, 
I think about an incident where uh, Tulani Davis, um, the great Tulani Davis, uh, one of our great multi-threat uh, writers, you know, as uh, and for and artists as well, you know, a novelist, poet, uh, critic, scholar, historian, activist, uh, playwright. But she wrote a critique of the of the Wooster Group in the paper, and because the Wooster Group um, were such a favorite nation by the theater department, um, there was actually um, a multiple writer response to her review that was published after her review. I'd never seen this happen in the course of the paper, but essentially, you know, it was around a piece they did around the Emperor Jones, they were wearing blackface, you know, and so the white theater writers at the paper felt compelled to basically chasten and, uh, and correct um, or attempt to correct uh, her critique in favor of the Wooster Group. And, that, and that's where, you know, it was the first time at the paper where I'd seen um, that kind of eruption of, of white power and support of white artists around uh, a black writer's critique of how uh, white artists were representing themselves, you know, um, as um, as people who had a certain license to deal with um, uh, black representation, you know, in black history, um, and uh, and and ultimately, you know, a black critic in a particular way, um, and. Um, you know, in general, um, what might occur in terms of pushback at the paper came from the readers, you know, so that it wasn't uncommon um, <laughs> that because of political coverage or cultural co coverage, um, you know, bomb threats might be directed, you know, at the paper. We might have to clear the floor because somebody didn't like what was published in the paper that week. Um, I remember, and you know, for myself in particular, I, I when Michael Jackson's uh, Bad album came out, um, I wrote a piece that was kind of an early um, recognition of what was going on with his face, you know. And the headline, uh, and it, you know, it was a cover, uh, got a cover mention, and it said, "I'm white," you know, on Michael Jackson's Bad. You know, and um, and I remember, uh, you know, I got I got you know death threats through the mail, and I think somebody even put a Yoruba curse on me. You know what I mean? Because at that time, um, the idea that um, Michael Jackson's blackness should be questioned through his cosmetic surgery choices was um, it wasn't something people were ready yet to put on the public table. You know, and uh, what I know is that what I, you know what I also learned just being in New York at that time, you know, which had um, you know, like some major black journalistic publications um, that um, you know were were vintage and, and legacy, like Essence, like Ebony, um, like the African American, uh, the Afro American newspaper, Amsterdam News, was that um, you would you know, you were discouraged from writing things that would be considered uh, critical of Black artists. You know, um, the idea was that Black press is for Black upliftment, you know, of Black people working in the world, you know, and so you were not to threaten um, their economic or career opportunities or um, advancement through writing things which uh, were about dissecting the work or, you know, you know, trying to uh, um, offer something of a, a balance um, and, a, and a way away from a kind of a celebrity hagi hagiography, you know, of folks. So, you know, I came, I came to realize that because so much of what, uh, established me as a writer 
came from being at a place that um, empowered um, not just my criticality, but the the voice in which it spoke, you know, and um, you know the use of um, of just language and rhetoric and vernacular and uh, and profanity, you know, in terms of um, uh, presenting myself, you know, as as a writer, that it would not have happened if I had. Uh, had to establish a career in the in the black press and particularly as a as an arts critic you know um now what's interesting is that if you go back in the history of the black press uh under jim crow um i mean there there was like no attempt uh to uh to shelter uh, our creative communities, you know, from the the lances and barbs of the critical writers at those at those papers at that point in time, you know, it was um, it was interesting. It was a different idea around what criticality had to contribute to the conversation, you know, in in that if we're going to be critical of uh, the way people are moving. Um, or the way people are organizing or the, or the stances people are taking um, editorially or uh, polemically or in their, uh, their politics, their activism, then of course that would extend to um, what you had to say about, um, you know, like the recent, whatever the, the current uh, or the contemporary uh, uh, club dates or concert dates of a Duke Ellington or Billie Holiday or, you know, uh, Miles Davis, because in fact, all of those artists um, in their practice were practicing uh, a criticism as well. You know, the choices they made to not be uh, mundane, to not be uh, conformist, uh, to not be mediocre, you know, uh, relative to the field were of course seen as, as things that um, uh, identified them as critical thinkers from within the culture. And so what I realized in retrospect was the fact that all this training I got in criticality from these painters and these poets and these filmmakers, you know, who also considered themselves to be activists, you know, um, was actually part of that tradition of the interior uh, criticality of um other black arts you know and um um i you know i i've uh, i you know there's a statement that uh the pianist keith jared made once where he said that um uh, the only adequate adequate criticism of a piece of music is another piece of music right which would, uh, on one level, you know, just nullify the whole notion <laughs> of a critic's function, you know what I mean? But I don't think that, um, um, in a sense, I don't think that what we, what we do is necessarily about um, trying to replace um, whatever the art is or whatever the expression is um, with our, um, our little takes on things, you know. Um, it's, about, it's definitely about, at its best, I think, expanding the conversation around um, the work and the culture and actually bringing in uh, a diversity of voices, you know, or of, uh, of information about where this work situates itself in the world, you know. Um, and uh, I think, you know, one of your questions was, um, or, you know, and the invitation was to think about um, uh, criticism that it really worked uh, for us in a particular way or not work. But what came to mind for me is actually it's uh, a piece that uh, the critic Rene Ricard wrote called A Radiant Child. And in that piece, what's really powerful about it is that he's making this um, distinction 
between the way in which, you know, tagging and bombing and, and uh, train riding uh, functioned um, and the way Jean-Michel Basquiat functioned, you know, kind of on the inside. And that what Jean-Michel was very conscious of, you know, um, Ricard points out, is putting his political acuity in his work, but doing it with only, sometimes with only a couple of words or a couple of words attached to an image, you know, or detached, you know, for, from an image. But um, the way that he claimed all these things, we think is kind of common tropes of his work, the, uh, you know, crowns and copyright sig symbols and Roman language, you know, or, you know, really a polyglot approach to, uh, to, to language, you know, um, in that, um, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's many different, there's signifiers in different languages in the work, but, you know, what he was doing that um, the folks writing on the trains and even the folks who came into the galleries from the trains were not doing was um, recognizing that you're making this work, you know, not for the gaze of your folks, but for this context, you know, and um, I think that um, in the writing that, you know, I've done certainly in the individual art context, it, it's, it certainly with a sense of, um, of having, uh, it's not a universal writer. It's definitely, um, I think about the black gaze the whole time I'm writing, but at the same time, I recognize that, um, I'm being uh, published, you know, by uh, uh, publishers or galleries or museums or uh, um, curators um, who, you know, may not may not uh, share my my uh, cultural concerns and cultural background, you know. But I think the thing is that from having a context like the Voice to developing it's like i'm never um functioning with a sense of inhibition around that white gaze it's like once you've kind of established you know once you've kind of liberated yourself from that within a white institution it's uh you just work with a certain sense of audacity you know and confidence you know and kind of not giving an f you know <laughs> when you're at when you're uh in the creative moment Absolutely. Greg, Greg, do you mind if we just sort of bring in Kayleen as the final speaker and then we can continue this conversation in the Q&A? Perfect. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I love that example you brought up too. It's so interesting how sort of sometimes even when the critic is allowed to speak, there's a certain policing of the voice within an institutional framework, mm -hmm. which is such an interesting question. Thank you for raising that. So um, our final speaker is Kayleen Wilson-Goldie, who's a writer and critic based in New York and Beirut. A contributing editor for Badoon, she writes regularly for Art Forum, Aperture, and After All, among other publications. She spent a decade working as a reporter and editor for newspapers in the Middle East and continues to cover the intersections of art, culture, and politics in the Arab world. She was a 2007 fellow in the USC Annenberg Getty Arts Journalism Fellowship Program and won a grant from the Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant Program in 2013. Her first book, Etel Adnan, on the paintings of the Lebanese American poet Etel Adnan, was published in 2018. Kayleen, screen's yours. Thank you. Um, I feel a little bit like the square on a board of shoots and ladders, where when you land on it, all of a sudden the ladder takes you someplace else entirely. Um, because it's interesting for me to be part of a panel on the view from the US when I feel I'm here kind of only temporarily um, after having lived in Beirut for a long time. And it's sort of, it's, I mean, that's the place that I write about and where I write from in a way. Uh, and so it's weird. I now feel like I'm trying to hold on to two different worlds at once and be in two different places and have two places in mind all the time. Um, and I mean, I can say that, um, but but at the same time, I think a lot of the issues of writing about art and contemporary art and modern art 
in a place like Lebanon resonate with a lot of what the speakers have said already. I mean, there is a sense that I think the, some of the strongest struggles in Beirut are about um, visibility and um, the, the struggle to be in a place to be seen that has a long intellectual history and an artistic history um, that is dismissed in the rest of the world as a basket case and is seen as hopping from one disaster to another um, or is considered belated and that you know any art practice that's coming out of there is following on something else rather than seeing that sometimes I think some of the most critical artists in a place like Lebanon are responding to conditions in the world that might be a, bell, a bellwether, as Yasmin said, of what's coming to a lot of people's future. Um, and um, I thought of two interesting examples of when criticism worked and when it didn't work for me. Um, and they're both, they're both questions about audience. Um, I mean, I think when w the example that I can think of that failed, um, and I mean, I should also say that I, I came to Beirut after having a sort of formative years as a uh, months as an intern at the Village Voice, which was sort of my utopian fantasy growing up. And and what I learned from that, even though, you know, the voice was already heading into a period of having real problems, um, but it was incredible to see a staff that was unionized and it was incredible to see a staff of like really big personalities and and critics that were not afraid to be a pain in the ass. And I think that is something that I, I learned because the stakes are often really high. You know, writing about art is not is not writing in the small bubble of the art world because often what you're writing about is touching on much bigger issues that are important. And there is a sense that what you can talk about in writing about art is more than what you can talk about sometimes on the politics pages or on the business pages of a newspaper. Um, but it's interesting, the two examples that I thought of were both, they were published within the same month in August 2007. And one was, um, I had really wanted to write a profile of Rabia Mrui, who's a performance artist, a theater maker. Um, and I wanted, it was the only time that I wrote for the New York Times. And I wanted to write a profile of him in the arts pages, not in the international pages, not as an interesting story for foreign news. Um, and as I was working on that piece, and I mean, I pitched it and they accepted it and it all seemed fine, but as I was writing that piece, uh, the work that he was about to present in Beirut for the first time after having shown it uh, in many places around the world, he actually, for the first time, submitted his script to the censorship board in Lebanon, which he's obliged to do, but had never bought, like he had refused and he had just kind of been able to go under the radar of not doing this. And the first time he submits a script to the censorship board, of course, the whole production gets shut down and it gets censored. And so this piece that I was working on for a paper outside became about him being censored which at the time I thought it was really important to say and you know you, looking back at it years later and it you know it caused this huge problem um, in Beirut that because the organizers had wanted to resolve it before anyone wrote about it and so nothing was written in the local press and then I went and sort of like jumped the queue and wrote about it for outside and and I think that in a way, they were right, because I think where, where it mattered most was in a local paper. And I don't think that I should have listened to the organizers, who are amazing people and some of the best, you know, most democratically minded people I know. Um, I don't think that I should have not written about it at all until, like, I don't think I should have had the terms dictated to me, but I think I should have written about it for the local paper I was writing for and not for a paper outside. And the example that I think actually worked was a completely bizarre piece that should not have worked in any way. Um, but it was, uh, I completely ripped off an idea from when Michael Kimmelman was, uh, an art, was the arts critic for the Times and he used to go to museums in New York with a, an artist and, and walk around and write about their visit. And so I started a series for the Daily Star, which is the English language paper in Lebanon 
where I would bring an artist to the National Museum. And one of the first people I did this with was an incredibly intelligent and very difficult, hard to um, encapsulate artist named Farid Armali, who is part Palestinian and part Lebanese and has family history in Beirut and comes there but doesn't live there, but is contributes to the sort of intellectual environment there. Um, and is also an artist who's a curator who was working with um, archaeology. He had just done a project working on archaeology from Gaza that was in a museum in Switzerland. Like it was all over the place. But he went into that museum and like curated a path through it and highlighted the most amazing pieces um, that made it impossible to say there's nothing here, there's no history, there's no curatorial practice. Because clearly, without asking the museum to do anything or to you know, welcome us, like we just went as normal people. Um, and he, you know, I mean, he, he found this one vitrine, this glass box that had the melted pieces of archeological relics that had been um, damaged when the museum was shelled during the Civil War that someone in the museum had just put in a glass box almost without comment, just in the corner. And the way he, um, as an artist and as a thinker, plotted his way through that just opened up a lot. Like, I mean, it was, it was almost like I was there only to sort of transmit that into the paper. And I thought that, that somehow that worked and it took, um, the local context the most seriously. And I know we don't have a whole lot of time, so I think I will just stop there and move on to your moderation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. So I'm going to ask some of the questions uh, from, from the chat. Um, one question from William Messer, and I, I wonder if there's anyone eager to answer this, talking about the role of criticism um, and, and the actual like loss of informed criticism and the, and the detrimental impact it's had on different uh, regions. Um, I wonder, Jasmine, if you want to talk about that in general, what some of the repercussions have been and how maybe Burnaway has sort of picked up the torch or has continued or changed the conversation, perhaps. And then just say, uh, we're often left valuing art by its monetary value and serious criticism engenders serious art, not only vice versa. So I wonder, Jasmine, if that's a question you'd like to address. I really want to push back on informed criticism, um, what that means, because when I hear informed criticism, that means um, advanced degrees from very fancy colleges or programs or anything like that. Um, I'm a high school dropout. All of my knowledge is autodidact. I've come by this all through the experience of my life and where I've lived and the things that interest me and my own sort of like aesthetic vision. I don't think that in any way should there be a barrier of a degree to say that you are an informed critic. Um, I think that's part of why we're in such dire straits um, because the interesting criticism and the interesting um, views of art and the interesting art are um, usually made by people who are poor or people who are existing on some sort of like marginalia um, I, so there is, there, so like the Orly plane disaster, that's a disaster because that was a lot of money that died that was going to like flush into Atlanta. Um, but I, I really, and I think that, um, informed criticism when that comes to my region where I live, that means people coming from New York, looking around, filing a report, and then leaving. Um, <clears throat> informed criticism to me should mean spending time with people on the ground, spending time with people who don't agree, spending time with people from the next state over. Um, in the South, we're very connected, even though that we're so spread apart. Um, what happens in Mississippi happens in Alabama, happens in Georgia. Um, so I just really like bristle at that um, because I think the most informed criticism that like I could rely on is um, I want to talk to like the elementary school art teacher in Tupelo about what's happening there. She is way more informed than someone from the LA Times 
coming down to talk about an artist living in Water Valley, you know? So I just like bristle at that a little bit. That's understandable. I think I think you're definitely addressing credentialism, which is I think something in the art world that sort of comes up in again and again. And and we even hear it sometimes when, you know, it, it always makes me laugh when you talk to a gallerist or someone and they tell you where the person's gone to school immediately, as if that's sort of a, a pass of some sorts or should already give you the frame to see all the work. Um, I wonder if anyone else has any thoughts about this topic, because I think all of you are writing from different positions and different positionality. Um, Jung Wu or uh, Kayleen, or is there something about that or Greg? Um, so, you know, I before I started teaching uh, at Carnegie Mellon, I taught it at the University of Louisville in Kentucky for uh, seven years. Um, and some of <laughs> and some of my students uh, actually um, recognize that there is um, uh, this great absence of um, sort of criticism in the arts communities uh, in Louisville. And I, I just said that in passing in class, in one of the seminars class, and I am just so proud to report that they now publish this amazing local uh, magazine of criticism called The Ruckus. And, mm -hmm. and, and what's so amazing, and as, check this out, it's in color too. Uh, what's really amazing is that they are part of the ecosystem of a creativity in Louisville, just as uh, Jasmine was saying, so that what they're saying is just so deeply already uh, lived through and shared, you know? So there's a different level of um, caring and different level of knowledge that someone who got flown in won't be able to necessarily understand. I, I am not trying to hear say one is uh, better and one is bad, so we should uh, you know stop this and we should do that. But I'm trying to say that we need to create an environment in which that there can be dialogue and these different intersectional uh, viewpoints can thrive together. You know, and, and I, I think that that. that that may sound naive and idealistic, you know, but I think that's what we really need now. Great point. Um, any other thoughts by Greg or Kayleen? Okay. Okay, great. So my next question, actually, um, I'm, I'm going to just sort of build off something that I think we don't talk enough about as critics and uh, people who write criticism in general, is how do you all think we could support one another? What would that actually look like as critics to support? Because I think, you know, there certainly doesn't feel like there are strong networks of, of, and I'm not talking about networks, professional networks, like the one we're talking on now, but I'm talking about individually. How do you think that uh, other critics could support your work potentially? Anyone have any thoughts about that? Uh uh the way that i usually engage with other critics who i don't know or haven't had a relationship with is usually through some form of mutual aid um so hurricane ida was like a uh came on the same day as katrina prospect was supposed to be happening so there was like a great sort of people stuck people don't know if they're gonna get paid for this commission whatever um so offering mutual aid whether that be um a spare bedroom or uh, suggestions how to navigate out of New Orleans, how to navigate out of FEMA. That was how um, I built relationships with um, critics that I might not have ever had a relationship with before. And I think that will be more and more common in the future as um, climate catastrophe and things like that happen. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Well, I consider myself to be on the pay it forward plan um, you know, uh, relative to all the support that I got, you know, from older thinkers and intellectuals and teachers, you know, along the way. And so, um, I've had, uh, a couple of occasions where at the end of teaching a student, uh, would say, I really want to write, you know, uh, professionally as a critic. And so I've actually introduced uh, via email, you know, those writers and their samples to the editors that I know it, you know, Rolling Stone or Fader or uh, 
The Voice, MTV News, you know, and um, and they've, you know, uh, on on a number of occasions, like they've been able to get work, they've been able to get that all but impossible to generate for yourself foot in the door, right? Yeah, absolutely. Kayleen, I wonder if you had any thoughts. Yeah, I mean, uh, someone just said this in the the chat, but one thing is definitely. Um, uh, I try to really listen to feedback that comes to me um, and really take it whole uh, on board and consider it carefully and and keep it as an open conversation. Um, and I also try to I mean, I read my my colleagues work and I try to respond to it um, as often as I can. And, you know, they're critics, they're writers that I really admire that you know, I ask them to have coffee and I ask them for to go for a walk and I ask them to, you know, talk shop with me because I mean, as a as a freelancer and as an independent person, you know, I need that sense of camaraderie. Um, and also the magazine that, you know, it hardly exists as a magazine anymore, but it is still a publishing project, which is Bidoon, um, has done over the years a number of writing workshops that are really, you know, they're small. Uh, they might happen only over a couple of months or a couple of weeks, but some of them have been really amazing in terms of bringing people together who then went on to write. I mean, to really write and to write and have a critical practice for a long period of time. And so even if it's just, you know, a bunch of people coming together over a weekend or over, you know, who might meet only six times, um, those opportunities are incredible because you also see how how a group of people who want to write respond to texts and it's completely different every time and in every place right and there are a number of comments in the chat i just suggest people colette and william have written that i think might be useful just for people's juices to be flowing if you have any other questions um so now i i wanted to see if uh if, if anybody had any particular thoughts that came up as a result of some of these presentations. I thought it was a really great mix of four very different presentations that are all talking about their own positions and, and how we sort of uh, engage with that. So um, Jasmine, do you mind if I ask you a little bit about like sort of what, what do you think, because I mean, you were, you were talking specifically about the South, what do you think that publications and those of us who edit publications or write it for publications outside the South should be doing to help you know, bridge that gap, perhaps, in terms of understanding of art in the South? Or what is it that critics we can do to help build some of those bridges? Come down. Come here. Um, come here. Uh, talk to us. There are uh, what I would consider like legacy publications in the South. Art Papers uh, is headquartered in Atlanta and has been publishing for 45 years. I mean, that's, um, that's insane, really. Um, so there are like legacy sort of institutional sort of that way to engage, but it's really, uh, I think the most important thing that people can do is actually just come here um, and engage with people on the ground um, before pandemic, before pandemic in the pre times, um, I went to St. Petersburg, Russia for a month and um, they interacting with normal Russians at a bar or whatever. They were like, oh, I thought all Americans would be like Donald Trump. And I said, well, I thought all Russians would be <laughs> like Putin. But once we were there together, um, I just really feel that people don't get the South until they come here. I really just, really just come here. <laughs> I think that's the best, the best thing anybody can do. Great, great advice. Um, Greg, I had a question for you. As somebody um, who has been writing consistently about art for the last few decades, I'm curious what what motivates you to write criticism uh, today. Like, what is it? Is it an attempt to understand uh, things you are seeing? Is it a way of engaging? I, you know, as a prolific writer in many respects, I'm curious what it is about art that still um, pushes you back to the field and engaging with it. Yeah. Um... Well, the opportunities that I've had over the last decade to write about art has been by invitation of uh, mostly artists, you know, mm -hmm. who I uh, respect. Um, so uh, 
Kerry James Marshall, Dawood Bay, Ellen Gallagher, Wangeshi Mutu, uh, Kerry Mae Weems. Um, and um, one of the reasons I, I wanted to collect this work um, for a book is because the same kind of license that I felt at The Voice writing about music is the same license that I, I found in writing about artists in that you don't necessarily have to take this linear descriptive path to writing about these artists. It's like, you know, you can almost treat it like a metafictional project in, 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 in some cases. So, um, but I think that, um, you know, when there are artists that, um, you know, you, you, you respond to um, the work um, and you kind of already know its capacity to stimulate um, just on the walls. Um, because I, I'm one of those people that, that I don't really feel like I understand anything until I write about it. Um, it's a great opportunity, you know, to, to generate, uh, to, to, to enter into a, a, a generative dialogue um, with what these artists are, are doing. And I mean, it frequently involves, you know, conversation with those artists. So I, I learn things about um, their, um, you know, what, what moved them to make certain choices um, in the work, you know, and things that um, may not necessarily um, be on the surface when you're encountering the work in a in a, in a gallery or, or museum, you know, um, uh, I'll give you an example of like when I, I, you know, just wrote an essay for uh, Dowd Bay's uh, new book, Street Portraits, which are done in, um, done in Brooklyn and um, I think DC and Chicago, you know, over about a 10 year span. Um, and, um, but when the book came out, I, I appreciated like the quality of the printing he had done. And, you know, he just talked about how, like, his, his mission was to go into these neighborhoods, but to come out, you know, or to, to produce the highest quality prints that he could of, of these subjects, like the, the rendering or the, the capturing of folks in, in, in these communities is, is spectacular. But he talked also about how he directed the things, um, you know, or, or, or the encounters, you know, um, and got some people to look meaner than they normally would have, or to stand a little straighter than they would have, you know, or to be confrontational in their gaze, you know, and uh, it's those kind of revelations like from the artists, you know, or from coming to understand things, understanding things about, uh, you know, the, the artists that, um, you know, is definitely a great motivator. I mean, you know, um, Jasmine's uh, focus and concentration on the South, you know, and, you know, just even the conversation about people being told you need to get out, you know, um, um, is, is, um, is, is provocative to me because one aspect of a number of, of uh, you know, really well-known Black artists now, so many of them is that they, they come from Mississippi or Alabama, you know. Um, yeah, but how, how old, are, like Suzanne Jackson is in her 70s. Um, you're yeah, well, I'm, I'm thinking of, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but the thing I was thinking about, though, was like, it's not so much, you know, you know, um, you know, because, you know, if you talk about people like, like, uh, like Jack, Jack Whitten, Carrie James Marshall, um, you know, you. Carrie so, Weems. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, uh, Arthur I mean, Jaffa. <laughs> oh yeah, Arthur Jaffa. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. My my classmate. You know, best friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, but what you're saying about people need to come to the South to understand it is like it's also the aspect of their work that's not understood as being kind of grounded in their. Southern history, Southern experience, Southern families, you know. I well, mean, and there's also, there's also something very scarily extractive about it is 
um, yes, please come to the South, but yes, please don't come to the South and go to Joe Mentor's artist environment and dismantle it and sell it. And like, there's a lot of like extractive sort of violence around, especially black art in the South that um, I'm not sure how to deal with. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, you 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 know what you talked about it existing in the in the margins of the conversation. I mean, that goes on for decades with a number a number of these artists who, um, you know, like like um, uh, like a Witten, you know, or like the Afrikoba artists that the art world decides to discover when they've got one foot in the grave and mm-hmm. collect all the work and profit, you know, kind of build them up as as superstars, like, you know, five minutes before they before they check out. I mean, it's all part of the story, but, you know, until I saw the work, until I saw Joe Minner's work um, on his land, you know, with the graveyard as the backdrop, or uh, mm-hmm. saw Thornton Dow's work in his studio behind the machine shop, you know, mm-hmm. I didn't understand where Sun Ra came from, you know, in terms of like, because I didn't know there was a creative environment that Sun Ra, um, you know, created, you know, or developed himself, evolved from in terms of the visual culture around him, you know. And so, I mean, I think, and I think that that, that conversation about what's going in the work, what's going on in the work that's specifically related, uh, related to where these artists come from is something that hasn't, it hasn't happened yet in terms of um, the critical writing about them. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make it happen. I'm trying I know, to, I'm, try, I'm, I'm try, trying, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to do it. Um, you know, I, I yeah, know I'm that's trying. right. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. thank you. So that, 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 that's such a great point, particularly because I, there's a long history of this sort of extractive attitude towards the South culturally. Um, many of you may not know, but the Brooklyn Museum's acquisition of Coppola House from North Carolina at the beginning of the 20th century actually started initiating historical societies around the country because in the South they realized their culture was sort of being dismantled and sort of on display in institutions of the North. So there's a very long history of that. Um, Jung Wu and Kayleen, I wanted to give both of you the last word. And I wondered uh, a question maybe um, if you'd like to answer because I think Kayleen was sort of touching upon this a little bit is, I'm wondering if there are types of art writing or art criticism you'd like to do that there aren't forums for? Do you know, imagining what could be and that doesn't exist yet, or perhaps types of writing you wish would exist more of? Um, okay, sure. Um, I, we've been talking about this um, you know, with my students in class and it's the difference between speaking nearby versus speaking about. And it's what Trinity Minha talked about. And instead of me trying to paraphrase it, I'm gonna just read three lines. Um, Although you are very close to your subject, you're also committed to not speaking on their behalf, in their place, or on top of them. You can only speak nearby, in proximity, which required that you deliberately suspend the meaning, preventing it from nearly closing and hence leaving a gap in the formation process. So I think that as critics, we need to be very sensitive to speak nearby and leave that gap open. Thank you. Kayleen, do you have any thoughts? Uh, lots. Um... I think, um, I mean, I would like to see now that, and again, this is sort of from left field in a way, but given everything that has happened in the Arab world since 2011 until now, I would like to see, and how atomized um, art scenes in individual cities have become, you know, where the sort of, uh, you know, so many artists have left Cairo and have left Beirut and have left Ramallah and have left even Istanbul and are sort of recongregating in places like Berlin and some in New York and some in Paris. Um, I would like to see more extremely detailed, uh, very granular writing about artists and their work that, you know, has multiple languages 
in it and maybe risks incomprehension, but sort of captures the all that has happened um, over the last 10 years that's been really sort of, you know, from euphoria to just shattering uh, disappointment and disillusion. Um, and I think that I think risking incomprehension to bring people in to try to understand and to maybe feel disoriented by not knowing the historical references, but so they look them up and learn from uh, being really brought in instead of instead of the artists kind of you know appealing to an international or generic language. I would like to see more of that. I love that. I love the idea of inviting incomprehension as a way of maybe finding a new way out. Um, perhaps. I, I love all that. So thank you everyone uh, for participating in the conversation and uh, uh, thank you for offering your questions and I hope you all have a chance to sort of scroll through the different comments and hear what other people are having to say. And uh, Norman, do you have any final words that you'd like to say to wrap things up? You're, you're on mute, Norman. Anyway, just thank you, Rog and um, panelists. It was it was really great to get this sense of the the different positions from which and writing takes place and the places where it appears and how and maybe it's the interface of that and that we need more and more complicated interfaces. Um, for the future, but it's been a great, thank you, Elizabeth, for laying down the gauntlet and asking us to come up with something. Um, and it's always great knocking heads together and trying to see if there's any juices left in them. And there were <laughs> lots of them. So uh, it's just a great pleasure. And I think the other great thing is um, we are looking forward to more international collaborations at ICA USA with um, ICA, other, other ICA chapters, because they're doing things that are um, within the matrix and or adjacent to what problems are staring us in the face. So um, have a nice evening and some of you sleep well. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.